Welcome to week five of our new series titled, say it with me, Fear of God. If you're excited, make some noise, make some noise. I'm so glad you're in the house. My name is Marlon, last name is Medina, and God has given me the beautiful privilege to be the lead and founding pastor of Crib Church. So if this is your first time here, I want to say that this is family, this is home. Welcome online. God bless you. We're glad to have you as our guest. Um, we're doing a series titled Fear of God, and it's all about honor, worship, and actually having respect for the Lord. And uh, today we're going to look at chapter 3, and it keeps on getting more interesting. And the reason why is because I believe that chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, addresses our specific season right now. I believe that after God has asked us to surrender, we enter what we call a wilderness, which is what Gina was speaking about this past midweek. And uh, this wilderness is almost synonymous to what we call process in life. And I believe that Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, addresses process. And it's so amazing how God timed this so perfectly for us. So without further ado, why don't we pray and we're going to get into chapter 3, okay? Close your eyes with me right there where you are and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this moment that you've given us. We pray in the name of Jesus that tonight, today, you may speak to all of our hearts. That you may provide, Lord God, the right perspective. Give us fresh perspective so that we may walk through, Lord God, this process that you've given us. May we go through it and see through it. I pray in the name of Jesus that you may remove every spirit of distraction, anything that wants to keep us away from focusing and receiving your word today. Let us have a gateway over our heads, Lord God, from heaven, so that your word may pour into our hearts. Thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, I place this moment in the palm of your hands. May you do as you wish. In Jesus' name we pray. We say, amen. Amen. Today I titled my message, Honor Thy Process. And we're going to start in Malachi 3, verse 1. It says like this. Look, this is God speaking. I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, we're looking at the word messenger, and that's the focus of this first part. The person that God is referring to through uh, Malachi's penning is who we call John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist was actually Jesus' cousin, and this dude was a dude with a beard. He had a steady diet of (laughs) bugs and honey, and he had a beard. He was a man's man. Uh, this guy was so filled with the Holy Ghost. He was so filled with God that he would come out of his cave because he used to live in a cave. He would yell a sermon for like about 30 minutes and people would actually, crowds would come and give their lives to God. He was baptizing crowds. He had somewhat of a rock star status. He was a celebrity. He had a following. And he had one of the most important, I think possibly the most important role that anybody can play on this life and this earth. And that was for him to prepare the way for Jesus to step into the scene. He had a big, big, big role. He was so amazing that Jesus made a huge statement about him by saying, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was man of the year every single year. This guy was, I mean, if God himself said that no one is as great as him, that is telling you the type of caliber that John the Baptist was. This is who he refers to as his messenger. And like I said, his role was to prepare the way for Jesus to step into the scene, which is an honor. The greatest honor for you to make the way for the savior of the world to step in. That's huge. And as soon as Jesus came into the scene, here's the crazy thing, though. John had to step out. So that means that all of his following, all of his entourage, all of his VIP access, all of the multitudes that were following him, all of his hard work had to be given to Jesus. They were about the same age. They were young. They were younger than me, than what I am right now. I'm 31. They were in their 30s when this happened. They were 30, both of them. And he had to submit everything under the process that God had prepared for him. John had one of the most humble hearts we read about in the entire scripture, actually. And we know this because here's a line that he spoke about Jesus and himself. He said this, may he increase as I decrease. John's heart was a humble heart. In other words, he was saying less of me and more of you. This is him saying, I'm honoring my process. 
I'm submitting to God's plan. I'm submitting to God's will. I'm submitting to God's ideas for my life. Yes, I know that I had a stage and a platform and the spotlight and the following and I had a status. But all of that is nothing to me if I gain the will of God. If I place the will of God above my own, I am content. This is what we call submitting to process. It's difficult. It's laying down our lives. Now, the end of John's ministry came the moment that Jesus appeared and he ends up getting killed he ends up getting beheaded actually and the person that he made a way for him the person that he made a way for which was jesus jesus never rescued him out of the difficult process that he had to endure so in other words john the baptist literally wasted his life on jesus he wasted his life on jesus dead killed, murdered, for being under process. Now, I'm not saying that this is your life story. (laughs) What I'm saying is that, you know, in our generation, to waste your life on Jesus feels something foreign that God would never ask us to do. But the moment that you deny your own plan, the moment that you deny your own life and you submit under process, you deny your feelings, you die to self, We are being like this great messenger that God himself, Jesus himself spoke and said, no one is greater than him. Submitting on the process. And then we keep on reading and says this, then the Lord you are seeking, he will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, this is not the same messenger. No, this is the messenger of the covenant. This is Jesus, whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So the whole entire time that we've seen the people of Israel, um, we've seen that they had tons of questions for God. And most of the times they were questions of anger and they were questions of frustration. And this typically tends to happen where we begin to question God out of anger, frustration. It typically begins to happen when we're in the middle of a process where we don't understand, where we don't see why things are going the way that they're going, when we don't understand why he's asking us to go through what we're going through. And so the question is this, How was God responding to them? Because if you read chapters one all the way to two, right, which we have for the past four weeks, it's the people of God asking a lot of questions to God, almost accusing him in a way. Not almost. They were accusing him through questions. I mean, if you go, why are you so stupid? You're not really asking a question. You're pretty much making an accusation. And this was the pos- this was the problem with all the people of Israel. For like two complete chapters, the ones that we've covered, they're asking God questions and their questions out of frustration and their questions out of anger. And how does God respond? He responds with presence. Wow. Wow. That's good. By saying, wow. I'm going to show up. Wow. Wow. So good. There are some questions that we sometimes will have And God will not answer them the way that we're expecting him to. And instead, he answers them with presence. I'll give you my presence that brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. One of the most popular expressions that you'll read about in the scriptures is fear not. God, like sometimes having to yell it at his people, fear not. Sometimes in mild conversation, fear not. But most of the time it's fear not. Fear not. And this is something that we read about over and over and over and over again. I think it's possibly the most repeated expression ever in the scriptures. Fear not. Watch this. For I am with you. Presence. Not because I have an answer for you, but instead because I am with you. So for chapters one and two, people are asking, 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 asking. Chapter three, verses one, God is saying, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be with you. Fear not. Anytime that major key players in the scriptures went through something difficult, we're about to gain more territory, step into another realm of influence, step into a promise, step into higher levels. They would have to go through a process. 
And every time that they were in the process, they had questions. Like you today. You may have questions in regards to why are you going through what you're going through? Why is it so difficult to do what you're called to do? Why are the triggers in your life so real right now? Why is God allowing all these things to happen right in the moment when you have to sling your slingshot and kill Goliath? And you have questions. Why am I going through this? Why do I have to step into that? I'm afraid and I'm, and why would God make me? And God is saying, presence, fear not. Fear not. Fear not, not because I have an answer. That's not what Jesus says. It's fear not. For I am with you. I'm with you. I go before you and I go behind you. I'm all around you. One of my favorite lyrics right now in this season is by a song called New Wine by Hillsong. Now what you think about Hillsong, I could care less. Their lyrics are fire. It says this. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. Right? I'm giving you this area of my life. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you into your careful hand. And here's the part where God is saying, fear not for I'm with you. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. You don't need to have all the answers to the questions while you're going through the process. As a matter of fact, when you choose to trust God in the process and you submit and you remain in the process, you are honoring thy process. Sometimes the answer to the question you need is the presence of God. Because we may feel like we need a counselor, someone to tell us something. But oftentimes what we need is not a counselor, but we need a comforter. This is part of your process. All right, let's get into verse two. By the way, this is all the intro. This is not even the main part. Verse 2 says this, but who will be able to endure it when he comes? Right? He's talking about Jesus coming. Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal. Wow. Ooh, see that, 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 that talks about process. Yeah. The refinement of metal. Yeah. The fire talks about heat. There's a difference with having a title of a follower of Jesus versus having the character of a follower of Jesus. It's the character of a follower of Jesus that allows us to have a legitimate faith. Without faith, no one can please the Lord. One that truly pleases and worships the Lord. Without that fire purifying our character of a follower of Jesus. You will not have a faith that pleases God. Nah. It'll be a Walmart version of faith. (laughs) Nothing wrong with Walmart. Yeah, this fire is what produces an authentic believer. Your character is what makes you real. It's what verifies you. You want that blue check mark? You want the verified check mark in your faith as a believer of Jesus? You're going to have to go through process. Going through process means going through fire. So the question is this. How do you develop your character? Character that's been purified. Character that's been processed is what makes you legitimate. It's what verifies you. So the question that we must beg to ask is, So then how do we develop that character that gives us that blue verified check mark in our life? Well, Paul talks to the church in Rome, and he says this in Rome chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Someone say problems. Problems. Someone say trials. Trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And guess what endurance does? Endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
So we notice that problems and trials are the things that God uses. In other words, problems and trials are the fire that God uses to refine us. Yes. Problems and trials are sometimes difficult to go through, but once we go through, we become purified because it's fire. God uses these moments as fire moments to put us in the heat so that we could be purified. Yeah. Yeah. Problems and trials. What's unfortunate is that we live in a generation that runs away and escapes our trials. But what we're failing to understand is that without problems and trials, we cannot develop our character. The biggest problem in our generation today is that we have a generation called escapism. Where our feelings dictate every single decision that we make. And so when we're in a moment of discomfort, our feelings are saying, run! Run! Bandit ship! Leave him on red. Leave her on red. Run. Ignore it. Sleep it off. Sleep it all off. Just go to sleep for five days. Sleep it all off. Or other times it's numb yourself. Medicate yourself. Get yourself drunk. Get yourself high. And we try to escape. Others of you, it's not getting drunk on drugs or alcohol. Getting high on drugs and alcohol and all that type of stuff. Others of you, it's anime. Go escape, escape into a fantasy world. K-drama. And escape. And you, and, and, or, 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 you know, others of you are much better than the rest of us. You know, you go read a book or something. <laughs> go read a book. And, and you do this to escape, escape, escape. Nothing wrong with rest. But I think that when we run from our problems and our trials, we're forgetting that it is our problems and our trials that purify and develop our character. And a developed character, once again, is what verifies you as an authentic follower of Jesus. It's one thing for us to call ourselves followers of Jesus. Just have the title on our bio on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or LinkedIn. (laughs) It's one thing to carry a title, man. But are you really an authentic, verified follower of Jesus? Will you go to death for Jesus? If you don't have the character, you will never die for Jesus. But you can never have the character of a genuine, verified, authentic Jesus follower. If you keep on running from your trials and your problems, you got to stop running. You got to stop running. You go from church to church. And then as soon as there's a problem in one church, as soon as there's a confrontation, as soon as God challenges you, it's a trial for you. It's a problem for you. You run away. But then you go to the next one. In in 10 years, you've gone to eight churches. You, You keep on running from your trials and you're not allowing God to purify your character. Wow. It's, it's, it's the same thing with commitment to a relationship. We're contractual. This is what we spoke about last week. And you go from relationship to relationship to relationship, from guy to guy to girl to girl to girl. Why? Because the moment that you have a problem, you run away. Oh, wow. yeah. You start a program at school, a course at school, and the moment that it gets heavy, you quit. And you start a million different careers. <laughs> and you run every single time that you confront a problem or trial. And God is saying, I can't develop you. Because you keep dishonoring thy process. We live in a generation that escapes our trials. Sociologists say that 
If our present generation had to face the economic depression of 1929 that lasted all the way to the early 1930s, it wouldn't have the strength in their character to go through it. They would die. They would die. And the reason? It's because this generation has become accustomed to escaping their trials in difficult circumstances. And that's precisely where character is made. Now, crisis, it's very important to understand that a crisis doesn't always develop character, but it always reveals character. A crisis, a trial, a difficulty, a circumstance, a problem won't always develop someone's character. But one thing for certain that it can do and it will do and it accomplishes is this, that it reveals the person's character. When a person embraces the trial or the crisis, this allows God to develop their character. But when a person rebels against the trial or the crisis or the process, you know what this does? It doesn't develop it, it deforms the character. This is how people have very bad patterns in life that they've been in church their entire lives, but their character's completely deformed. Why? They've had the title of a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, but their character is not developed. Their character is deformed. Why is their character deformed after decades of being a follower of Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because they've rebelled against the process. They've not embraced crisis. They've not embraced trial. They've not embraced problems. They've ran away from circumstances, problems, crisis. They've rebelled against it, thus making their character deformed. So when a person rebels and says, forget this, it's too hard, the pressure's too difficult, the weight is too much, Ah, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna go through it, I don't wanna have the conversation, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. Ah, I just, I'll just sleep it off. You know, <laughs> that, that you are deforming your character. And, and God is saying in his word, I'm a, I'm a fire that refines. Yeah. Do you know how metal workers process silver? They take a clump of silver and they, huge, they hold these huge utensils and they grab it and they put it in the fire. Yeah. And the lady was once curious with this process. So she went to go see how a silversmith would actually purify and process silver. And she said that she saw the guy put the metal in, take it out and look at it. Then he'd put it back in and he'd take it out and look at it. And he repeated the process a couple times, actually. And then on the last time, he'd take the metal out and he'd look at it. And then he'd see, and he said, it's, it's ready. So she had a curiosity and she said, why do you keep putting it in and out? And when you take it out, you stare at it and you don't remove your eyes from it. Why don't you take your eyes from it? And what makes you decide if it's ready or not? What makes you decide that it has to go back in? And what makes you decide that it's actually ready to take out? And the silversmith replied to the lady and he said, the silver that I'm putting in the fire is so that the heat can bring the impurities up to the surface. When I'm taking it out, I'm checking if I can see my reflection on it. If I can't see my reflection on it, it's because it hasn't been in the heat long enough to make all of its impurities come out, so I put it back in. But I'm also paying attention to it because if it's in the heat too long, it could fold, it could bend, and when I put it back in, I can lose the precious metal. So I'm constantly checking it out and I cannot remove my eyes from it because I'm paying attention if it's in there for too much and I'm also paying attention if it's reflecting me or not. Once I take it out and it's been there enough to the point where it needs to be, all the impurities come off. When I check it the last time, I can see my reflection on it. Once I see my face on it, it's ready. Can I tell you that God is a fire that refines you? 
And that when he puts you in the fire, his eyes never come off of you. That he will never give you something that you cannot handle. That he cares about you through the process. He's going to watch you go through it. He's going to take care of you. He's going to love you through it. He's going to make sure that you don't burn. He's got you in the palm of his hands. But God is saying to you today, I'm putting you in the fire. And I'm taking you out. And if your life does not reflect mine. I have to put you back in. If your life does not reflect my face, I have to put you back in. How long we stay in the fire determines how much we allow God to remove impurities from us. When you're being put in the fire, God is just allowing the impurities out of your life to be removed because he wants you to be a reflection of him he is developing your character a trial and a problem reveal character shows us who we are god checks you when you're in the fire to see if your character reflects his when he pulls you out but puts you back in, it's because you're not ready yet. Every crisis has a purpose. Moses and Pharaoh were in a crisis. Both of them were. You read the story, you've seen the movie. Moses' character was formed. Pharaoh's was not. David and Saul were in a crisis. David's character was formed. Saul's was not. Paul and Demas, someone that you've never really heard about because you just need to read a little more. Paul and Demas were in a crisis. Paul's character was formed, but Demas's was not. Demas deserted Paul and went to the world because he preferred the world more than he did God's call. So why are trials good for us? Well, number one, because they make us seek God desperately and urgently. That's the truth. The truth is that we rarely are seeking God we do have our chair times. I'm not going to say that we don't. And we do have devos where we like read them and maybe have a small quiet time with God. But it's almost like we just do this to spiritually clock in and clock out. Wow. A trial and a crisis, on the other hand, will cause you to cry out. Yeah. It'll even cause you to seek within to even know if you've sinned or done something wrong. This then allows you to think through a biblical worldview. Yeah. Have you noticed that when you've done, when you're going through something difficult, some of us, right, we start checking within ourselves. I'm like, oh my God, did I sin? <laughs> Have I done something wrong? Did I sneak around? What did I do last week? And you start questioning your entire life. Yeah. And then you start digging into the word of God to see if the word of God is reflecting something inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. Or confronting something inside of you that isn't right. What is that? What is this? What is this? This is when you are in a moment of heat and fire. You pray different. You seek God different. There is more urgency when you're going through something difficult. This allows you to go back to the word and have a biblical worldview. I am astonished. I'm astonished. I'm surprised with how many Christians deal with problems They deal with them like the world does, not like the word does. I'm just so astonished with the worldview that most believers have when it comes to trials and problems. We resemble and reflect the world more than we resemble and reflect the word. We deal with problems and circumstances like the world does, not like how Jesus does. It's crazy to think that. Second, a crisis or a trial. And you know why we do that? I'll tell you why we do that. Because we don't have a biblical worldview. That's why we respond to problems and trials like the world does. Because we don't have a biblical worldview. We barely read our word. We, We don't know what God says. We don't see the world through the lens of God's view. We see the world through the lens of the world's view. That's very dangerous. Because then we sometimes find ourselves contradicting God. Contradicting his word instead of reflecting God and reflecting his word. Second, why are trials good for us? Because they force us to trust God at a deeper level. 
there's nothing like going through something that you can't control. Where you ran out of all of your imagination's wisdom. No more solutions. You have nothing in your arsenal. You have nothing but to trust God. Third reason is a crisis or a trial will bring impurities to the surface. Like we had been talking about. But let me give you a different example of this. When there's an earthquake, anything that is not good and that is shakable will fall. Right? Natural earthquakes, right? Buildings that are not prepared. But what's interesting is that the buildings that are prepared, that have a good foundation, that are actually strong, after an earthquake, what they typically do is they come and check all the columns of a building to see if there's any fractures or if there have been any cracks. If there have been cracks or any fractures, they now know where they were, where they were, where they were weak. <laughs> but without the earthquake, they can't tell where they were weak. Without heat, you can't tell if you have cracks in your columns. Fourth, a crisis or a trial will crush your pride. A crisis or a trial will crush your pride. Your pride is the garment that you use to cover up all of your insecurities and all of your fears. But a crisis will crush your pride and remove everything that you thought was strength. Do you know what pride is? Pride is walking in spiritual crutches, saying that you can actually run the sprint and win. And pride covers up your crutches, but then God sends a crisis and he goes, ooh, give me those. And he removes your spiritual crutches and then you can't walk. And you end up realizing, damn, I'm not as strong. I'm not as strong as I thought I actually was. Yeah. <laughs> it's not until you experience a crisis a real trial in life yeah. Yeah. that your eyes become open yeah. to the fact that you're not as strong as you thought you were. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crisis is okay, but what happens when we run? What happens when we escape? What happens when we quit and dishonor that process? You miss out on all of this. You miss out on actually being real. And you want this because you know this. Everybody hates a hypocrite. And maybe I shouldn't use the word hate. Everybody dislikes a hypocrite. Including Jesus. You know, Jesus came and died for all of us. And he gave the prostitute mercy. He gave the tax collectors mercy. He gave the most, he gave thieves mercy. You know who he didn't give mercy to? The hypocritical Pharisees. He flipped tables on them, I think. Yeah, he was very hard on them. Yeah, and I have so much to say about that, but I think we'll stick to the topic. <laughs> and then the word of God says, so let's read that verse one more time in Malachi verse two. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. Now, that's weird. <laughs> when I read it, I'm like, what is that trying to say? <laughs> the truth is that we all use a lot of soap, especially now because of this pandemic. Yeah. What do you carry in your cars? Hand sanitizer. Yeah. What do you carry in your purse if you're a girl? Hand sanitizer. Yeah. What do you carry in your pocket if you're a dude? Maybe. Nah, guys don't carry hand sanitizer. <laughs> we use soap for our hands. We use soap for our bodies. We use shampoo for our heads, soap for our dishes, soap for our laundry. Please don't use uh, laundry soap for your uh, dishes or the other way around. We have soap to wash our car. We have soap to wash our floors. We use soap to clean our countertops. We have special soap for carpet. Yeah. Now, how many of you have realized that if you clean something, you're going to have to clean it again? No one washes the dishes and go, glad I got that over now. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> no one ever says that. Yeah. So here's what I want you to know, my brother, my sister. 
Next time you rewatch something, stop and think. This is what Jesus does for me. He's rewashing me. Do not allow guilt to, to tell you to feel devastated because he cleaned you up and you made the mess again. Just like you doing the dishes every day, sometimes God is still cleaning up the same parts of your life every day. Someone say, I receive and give him glory for that because he's good. See, it's so interesting that sometimes we know, sometimes we know, sometimes we know that we're forgiven, but we're still feeling dirty. Not only for the sins that we've committed, but sometimes you're not feeling just dirty for that. You're feeling dirty because of the sins that were committed against you. What happens to someone that has been abused? Typically a survivor that's been abused. Most females after an episode or something that has happened, a tragedy like that has happened to them, they go to the shower and they wash themselves because they feel dirty. So sometimes we know that we're forgiven, but we're still feeling dirty. But Jesus doesn't only forgive us of our sins. He also cleanses us from our sin. You're not just forgiven and dirty. You're forgiven and you are clean. You are clean. You are clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus cleaned your soul. He washed your body. Jesus made you clean. All of our guilt and all of our filth, gone. Listen, man. It doesn't matter what the hell people say about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. Jesus died for you. The whole world could be against you, but it doesn't matter. You could be canceled on social media or anywhere. But it doesn't matter. You could be the most hated human being on earth. And it doesn't matter. Because Jesus chose to die for you. All right. Verse 3. He will sit like a refiner of silver burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites refining them like gold and silver. So he's talking about, you know, process, right? Why? So that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. It's about worship. This is why he does it then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. So when you allow God to purify you, your worship becomes pure. When you honor that process and you go through it, and I know it's tough, it's difficult. There's some bad habits that we have, some bad attitude problems that we have. There are some twisted, erroneous ways of thinking, mentalities, mental paradigms that we hold, not only hold, but have as strongholds that make us act or respond or behave in a wrong way. And God is saying, I'm going to submit you through a process that purifies you, that allows all these things that have been embedded into your soul, into your deep of the mind, And I'm going to bring it to the surface through fire. And I'm going to scrape it off. I'm going to put you in a process that makes you pure. Like I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. Especially when you've grown up a specific way in a specific culture with specific traditions and values. It's one of the most difficult things to let go of. But when you allow yourself to go through the process, you honor that process. God is saying... I'll make you pure. And when you're pure, your worship to me is pure. But the question is this. Do you really desire? Do you really desire to give God pure worship? Is that in you? Do you really desire? Like, let me put it to you this, okay? Like, sometimes, you know, we have family members that we really love and some that we really don't love. Yeah, or let me put it to you this way. We have family members that we really like or family members that we don't really like. Yeah. 
And so, like, let's be honest, okay? Don't leave me all alone up here. I know that you have those. There's always that weird uncle that shows up at your family gallons. You're like, ah, why does he sit here? <laughs> the truth is this. When it's someone's birthday that you really love, you want to get them a good gift. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you want to go all out and actually give them something that had thought behind it. Something was something that was worth your while, something that costed you something. And we all know that it, when it's like the weird family member's birthday or the crazy family, you really don't put as much effort. Isn't that true? Come on, tell me the truth. Some of you are so bad that you don't even put the effort because you don't even get them a gift. You just go, my presence is your gift, so happy birthday. And, 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 and so it's so interesting that Thinking about that, those two different scenarios, yeah. you go to a place where you remember what you feel. One, you feel like giving something good. You feel it. You want to. You desire to please the person that you love. You desire it. But the other, you could care less. Same action. Two different people, two sets of hearts. When it comes to the Lord Jesus, which set of heart do you have? The one that cares or the one that doesn't? The one that says, I can get away with it. It doesn't really matter if I give him something worthwhile or not. Or the one that says, no, I genuinely desire to give him something pure. Because the truth is this. As imperfect human beings, we are prone to giving him blind, lame, sick, and stolen worship. This is a reference to week two. If you haven't heard it, go listen to it. It's almost like our proclivity to do so and only through honoring the process of being purified can we offer pure worship. Yeah. So the question still stands. Do you really desire to give Jesus your pure worship? Because if you do, you must honor the process. You must allow him to clean you. And purify you. Yeah. Why do I have to go through all this process of my character getting developed? <laughs> I'll tell you the end result. The end result. The end reason. It's worship. It's honor. Yes. Why am I going through all this? Why do I submit myself under this whole entire process? Why do I have to go through all these trials? All these problems? Why do I have to rejoice? Huh? <laughs> why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It all goes back to honor. Because when you're pure and you've been purified, you can offer pure worship. Yes. You must let him clean you and you must let him purify you. Yeah. All right, verse five, and this is the last verse for tonight. At that time, I will put you on trial. So we'll stop right there. I mean, this big statement, this is God saying at that time, I'm going to put you on trial. So how does Jesus deal with his people after his first coming? He comes as purifier, refiner, and cleaner. But how does Jesus deal with his enemies at his second coming? He comes as judge. Wow. Yeah. His first coming, which is when he came 2,000 years ago, yeah. he comes in and he's like, I'm here to cleanse you and I'm here to refine you. Grace, love. At his second coming, very, very, very near, we're very close to that second coming, yeah. he's not coming as refiner and cleaner. He's coming as judge. He's coming to judge. Jesus came the first time for salvation, but he's coming the second time for damnation. And he says, I'm eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers and liars. Sorcery has to do with manipulation. Sorcery has to do with controlling. Sorcery is pretty much what religion teaches you. Religion teaches you you're God and God is your butler and you manipulate him to give you what you want. And if you don't get what you want, God is being a bad God for you. Sorcery at its root. 
Now there's the occult part of sorcery, which is also bad, which is all that garbage that you are learning about on TikTok, which I think that you should cut off in Jesus' name. Anything that has to do with witchcraft, sorcery, the occult, is stuff that you have to cut in the name of Jesus Christ. God is against this type of stuff. So he says, I'm eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers. This is all the fornicators. This, is, this, this has to do with adultery. This has to do with sexual immorality. Anything that has to do with sexual sin. God is saying, I'm coming against that. Yeah. And he's saying, and liars. But how about the little white lies? Those two. <laughs> what, if I'm dying, what, if, what if I'm lying for a good reason? It's still a lie. He says, I'm coming against the sorcerers, the adulterers, the liars. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages. This is people that are just completely evil and rip people off. You have to be genuine. God cares about their heart. Who oppress widows and orphans. This, man, how many young kids are suffering around the world because of very disastrous, disgusting things that are happening? Child trafficking. God's against that. Or who deprive the foreigners living among you of, in, of justice. This is when you are not a just person. And you deprive people of justice. So much that we can say here, but we got to go. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So here's what I want to say. Right now, we are under grace. Because right now is the time after Jesus' first coming. His second coming has not happened yet. So if you're not a follower of Jesus or you're someone that used to follow Jesus and you stopped, I want to tell you something. His second coming is soon. Yeah, it's true. And if you're not following Jesus, you're in grave danger. You're in grave danger. Jesus will come a second time, but he's coming as judge. Right now, we can know him as friend, as comforter, as loving father. We know him as grace. We know him as love. But there will come a time where he's going to come as consuming fire. Yeah. Hebrews talks about that. God is love, but he's also consuming fire, not refining fire. Because he's coming as judge. Jesus comes as Savior the first time. But at his second coming, he's coming as judge. And those that think that they can get away with something, they'll realize on that day that you can't get away from anything. So Jesus died for you. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people have said about you or what they think about you. Jesus died to save you. So my call to you is this. Allow him to work in your life. Let him in. Stop running. Every time that it gets difficult or tough, let him work in your life. Let him finish and complete what he wants to do inside your heart. Honor thy process. Let him save your life. Honor thy process. I know it's not easy. You're not talking or listening right now to a person that ignores how hard it gets. I'm in on this the same way. The same way this is speaking to you, this has spoken to me. But one thing I do desire in my heart, and that is to really honor God and give him the purest worship I can. And I want to say something else too. I don't think it's right for us as believers of Jesus always talking about how hard it is, how difficult it is, how hard it is to go to church. Well, not right now because we're in lockdown. Because when I read the Psalms, King David would say, I delight. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. He wasn't always complaining like, oh my God, going to his house is so hard. <laughs> Poor me. I think that we have to stop talking about, oh my God, it's so hard to read the word. God and it's just so difficult and that's all we talk about and that's all we air in, in order to be vulnerable which is you know points for you but there has to be some type of purification and process that takes place in our hearts that we actually align our language and our thought process like King David would which is the word of God that said I delight in your words and your commandments 
Because this conversation always, you know, going, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. It almost makes us want to victimize ourselves. And the truth is that we're winning. But the more we go through our process, the faster we go through it, the faster we become champions in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm excited for, I would have clapped right there. So thank you right so much. I'm excited to come across the other side and be like, hello from the other side. I can't wait. Because there's a day of reward and recompense coming. There's a day of recompense and reward that's coming. There's a harvest that God is getting you ready for. If you're going through processes because God's shaping your strength and your character. To number one, give him pure worship but also to sustain the blessings that he has for you. Amen? Amen. Let's close our eyes and be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for this moment that you've given us. I pray in the name of Jesus that you may seal the seed in our hearts. Let it be planted and let it remain underground so that it may bear fruit, Lord God. Let your word bear fruit in the soil of our hearts. Thank you so much for this moment that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, we say amen. Love you so much. I'll see you again next week for week six of our Fear of God series. God bless you. Take care. Hey.